Well, welcome in the precious name of Jesus to uh, the stories of Evan Robert. In this episode, we're going to look at what was the motivating force behind his desire, his, his passion, his zeal that ultimately caused the birthing of the Welsh Revival. He would be a man that truly was given to prayer. In fact, he would be kicked out of his apartment, his flat, uh, because his landlord got fearful of his constant praying and his loud praying. Now, how many of us can say that we have been kicked out of somewhere because we pray too much? He would be seen walking down the street where he would just get lost in prayer, just cold, totally consumed in it. Regarding when he was given the opportunity to go to Bible school, one of his greatest concerns was that he would lose that time of fellowship and prayer that he knew with the Lord. So what caused this ordinary young man to become extraordinary for the Lord? To become a man so sold out to prayer? Because I believe that if we can get a hold and learn from these people, God desires to do it again. He's just looking for another person, an ordinary person, that will simply dare believe Him, dare surrender, and dare walk obedient, just like Evan Roberts. Let's pray and let's press in. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a hearing heart, and that we be like the sons of Ishakar, recognizing the times, and by the leading of your Holy Spirit, always knowing what to do. Teach us how to walk in your ways. And Father, impart to us such vision. Impregnate us with your purpose. That we, Father, might truly be a people of your word and prayer. That we might be those that would be history makers in this generation, serving this generation, so that your name would be glorified. I thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, Amen. Now, if you go to Joe chapter 2, this these couple of verses would influence many of the heroes of faith. And in verses 28 and 29, it says, And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my Spirit in those days. Now, you could argue that happened on the day of Pentecost. But in many ways, was it fully fulfilled? And as I said, there are many of the heroes of faith reading this would become impregnated for a vision again, recognizing what was going on in the hour and saying, God, we need a fresh move. Zechariah 10 once said, ask the Lord for the rain in its season. And therefore, there's a call for us as believers to recognize when this generation needs a fresh outpouring of the Spirit. If I go back to that time period prior to the revival, a minister said this, talking about Wales, it is ever the darkest hour before dawn. The nation always seems to be given over to the evil one before the coming of the Son of Man. The decay of religious faith, the deadness of the churches, the atheism of the well-to-do, the brutality of the masses, all these when at their worst, herald the approach of revival. Things seem to get too bad to last. The reign of evil becomes intolerable. Then the soul of the nation awakes. You will always find that it's not in an hour of great spiritual um, alertness of the church, but when the church is backed against the wall, when it looks like it's all over and the church is about to fail. But there's always a remnant, like Evan Roberts. And God always has those that will seek His face, because the Word declares that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Regarding Evan Roberts, it was said, For some years, the mind of Mr. Roberts had been turning in the direction of Christian ministry. He, in his spare time, was avidly devoted to reading such literature as would assist him in the preparation of his life work. Though his friends, with one consent, acknowledged his undoubted religious sincerity and unspotted moral character, there does not appear to have been manifested to the observant eyes our vigilant church leader any outstanding or oratical gift 
or special exploratory brilliance such as is universally expected in Wales and a candidate for such an exalted office. Evan Roberts quietly persisted in the pursuit of his dream. Everything religious secured preeminence in his mind and heart. Every one of his acquaintance concluded that Evan intended to be a preacher. God is not looking for the perfect vessel, but the yielded vessel. And he just sparked something in us. Something happened in Evan Roberts where he caught the vision and he caught the burden of the Lord and he changed his direction. Now, in the natural, people would have overlooked him, but they overlooked David. And they will always overlook those whom the Lord calls. But those who surrender to the call, God seeks to take the foolish to confound the wise. Continue. Um, it says regarding Evan Roberts' early years, our revivalist seems to have been noted for his on demonstrative studious habits when other boys romped and roamed his nature and perhaps his religious inclinations held him in a vice-like grip he was consumed and we have to come to a place where the burden of the lord is everything we can't play half-hearted if we recognize the lateness of the hour if we recognize what is truly at stake then we have to give 110 percent a full out commitment to the Lord, no more excuses. Evan Roberts explained, talking about what really began to change and motivate him. He said, this message of love is that which has already attracted so many to Christ in Wales. And if this be sufficiently realized and emphasized, it will continue to draw men, to arouse the churches and to save souls, so that the revival of which we are merely opening the floodgates will sweep over our country and thence from the isles to the uttermost parts of the earth. God always wants to do something bigger. He's just simply looking, and I believe in this hour, for a nameless group of people that will simply hear and obey and simply do. Those that I called following the 90-10 rule, where there's 90% of their life hidden in the secret place, behind the scenes, seeking the Lord in the Word, be found faithful before him and there's 10 percent in public doing we're so busy doing but are we doing what we're supposed to be doing and evan roberts gave himself wholly to the lord behind the scenes so that what he did in public was the outflow of that secret place life he had a series of visions and these visions became very important and really capturing this man one of those visions was a vision of hell and as he sees hell, he hears the voice, here would you be but for the grace. And I think many of us have lost all sight of the fact that we too all have fallen uh, short of the glory of God. And we're all due hell. But for the phenomenal, incredible grace of God. And we've lost sight that a generation is being swept into hell while we stand by and do nothing. Because we rejoice, well, we're going to heaven. And yet we are here by purpose and place to preach this gospel, to give our hearts and lay ourselves on the altar that as many people as possible might hear and might receive this glorious gospel. Evan Roberts had another vision in which he saw himself being weighed on a scale. He said he found himself weighed in a vast scale. Christ held it and his sins almost weighed him down when the love of Christ rescued him by writing the balance. As you look at the life of Evan Roberts, what got a hold of him was the love of the Lord. We can accept God's authority, but many of us don't get a hold of his love to the point that we're swallowed up and consumed in it. And if you ask me to summarize, to give you one word that really demonstrates or our, our, our covers the motivating force of Evan Roberts, it was love. It was not just any love. It was that divine love that we grow and come to understand better in the secret place as we develop our relationship with the living God. Continuing on, Evan Roberts would later say, my motive is a passionate desire for the privilege of proclaiming Christ to the lost. What is our desire? What are we here for? Are we so busy enjoying life? Are 
Do we catch the vision like Evan Roberts, that we're here for a purpose? We will enjoy life to the fullest in eternity, but we have an opportunity here on earth to do something for His glory. Continuing here, Evan Roberts added, to have this brought about soon must be our prayer, so that Jesus Christ may see the effects of the travail of His soul and be satisfied, and God may be glorified. He understood that God gave the vision. Revival doesn't come because we want it. Revival comes, as our a Tory explained, that God impregnates us with His vision. As we spend the time with Him, He captures us, and He begins to show us what He desires, that we might pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth. And we should recognize the hour that God is looking for a harvest, and if we're to see the harvest, we need to ask for the rain. Uh, if I continue here, talking about Evan Roberts and going back a little bit, he would say, for 10 or 11 years, I have prayed for revival. I could sit up all night to read or talk about revivals. It was the Spirit that moved me to think about revival. Somehow the Spirit knows how to capture our attention, knows how to get us so that we begin, begin to focus on, we begin to look at, and as we begin to look at, God begins to birth in us the vision for revival. We begin to see how He longs for a fresh move. We begin to understand that it's in the darkest hours of history where those that are bold enough dare believe and dare cry out, and God always responded in revival. You know, the darkest hours in history, God has so wonderfully turned around, and we live today, even secular society, in the blessings of revivals. We may not recognize or appreciate all that revival did, but revivals are a divine assault on society, where the Spirit of God turns up and everything changes. And in it, God brings a spiritual climate change and moral climate change, but He also begins to birth things. He begins to challenge things in society, things that He deems wrong, and begins to impart to us what He sees as the right things for, the, this, for this generation. Now, if I continue here, on April 8th, 1905, you will see that this actually happened a lot, but I'm giving you one meeting. What would often happen, as it did in this meeting, Evan Roberts would start with singing. It was an unusual series of revivals, and they were mostly driven by this worship. But it was not uncommon, like on April 8th, 1905, for Evan Roberts to stop everything and say, there needs to be a cleaning. We need to pray that God has to do His work. And I'm reminded, if you've studied the Hebrides revival, that they were praying for a season but seeing no results. And finally, one person got the revelation. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord except he who has clean hands and a pure heart? The, you know, I'm going to come to that verse. I want to skip it. Evan Roberts understood this, and maybe we need to get this as well. Give us revival or judgment. How many of us realize we are in the last days? We are on the verge of the greatest judgment and the wrath of God. And we need a revival. If we don't see revival, judgment is coming. We see a generation that the cup of sin is so close to being overflowing. And as long as we are on this earth, we are called to occupy till He comes. It is our responsibility as believers to be interceding, standing in the gap, laying our lives down for the brethren, crying out that everyone possible might receive this glorious gospel. Understanding God give us revival, our judgment is coming. In Psalm 30 verse 5, you know, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. I think of 
in John, and I think I wrote it down here, in John 21, 4, but when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. And what, if you go back and read, the disciples have lost the vision. And they're busy going back, and they go back to fishing, doing what they know to do. And they've been fishing all night. They knew how to fish. They were skillful fishermen, but they saw no results. And I feel that's where we are. We're doing all that we know, but it's us. And we need to come and once more come to the shore and have an encounter with Jesus so that we receive a fresh impartation from Him. We need the vision from Him. We need to hear His voice and do what He says and stop being busy doing all these things like the Laodicean church that are neither hot nor cold, but be found faithful doing what we're supposed to be doing, walking obedient. Evan Roberts, one of his favorite verses, and this is where I was leading to a minute ago, and he had boldly underlined this in his Bible. If my people who were called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. There's that one word that we always forget. We see these massive crowds gathering. We have these big prayer meetings. We're praying for the nation. We're crying out, but why are we not seeing results? It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble. And that's the part we miss. See, I look at Evan Roberts and there's that time of humbling ourselves submitting to him, submitting to his will, to his purpose, to his plan, and allowing him to change us so that we think like him, we walk like him. We're called to be his people, so we represent him on this earth. And it is so sad that we have misrepresented him, that we're not showing the world who he really is because we don't know him. And it's time the church repented and humbled themselves and got right. That's where I go back, as Evan said, there needs to be a cleaning first. We want to get into the worship. We want to see the revival. But there has to be a cleaning, a purging, and a pruning first. Evan Roberts was talking about how he wrestled, prayed for hours that the power might come. We want to say a five-minute prayer and then expect results. We have to learn how to wrestle, how to stand, how to pray. Previous generations didn't have all the distractions we do, and they prayed. And you know what? God answered. Revival was not difficult. It just simply required those who were fully persuaded, trusting that God is. And he is the reward of those that diligently seek Him. So they diligently sought because they saw what was hand, like Evan. They saw that, that this generation was being lost and judgment was coming. And they said, God, we must have revival. Now, if you look at this heart of this man and you want to understand his prayer life, you understand his determination, his commitment. Regarding one of the revivals, it was written in a newspaper. He completely broke down, falling on the pulpit desk in a violent and prolonged paroxysm, crying, groaning, and sobbing. While he was prostrated in the pulpit, prayers and heart-stirring appeals burst out all over the chapel. The whole Congregation weeping. He was not putting on a show. If you knew Evan Roberts, he didn't put on a show. He was living out who he was behind the scenes. He had spent so much time seeking the Lord. Now you understand why his landlord kicked him out. Because you start to get a glimpse of what his prayer life was like. But he got results. Let me share another one. Um, another vision that he had. And he says, I shook my head impatiently and strove to drive away the vision. And I'm going to stop and I'll show you a little uh, background to the vision. He gets a vision of his home church and he sees the youth. And this is very close to the birthing of the vision, of the revival. And he sees what actually would happen. And there's a point, I believe, that God is calling for us to simply obey. So he sees this vision of his home church and he sees the youth in that church. As I shook my head impatiently and strove to drive away the vision, but it always came back. And I heard a voice in my inward ear, as plain as anything, saying, Go and speak to these people. And for a long time I would not, 
but the pressure became greater and greater, and I could hear nothing of the sermon. Then at last I could resist no longer, and I said, Well, Lord, if it is thy will, I will go. Then instantly the, the, the vision vanished. How broken are we? How disturbed are we? See, when we fall in love with the Lord, and Evan Roberts, and I'll share another episode, got so consumed in that fellowship, that love of the Lord, that what the Lord loves, you love. And you become so moved because you want to please. You never want to grieve Him. What can I do for you, Lord? You know, we often sing the song, if you can use anyone, you can use me. But we don't really mean it because we don't want to be disturbed. We don't want to cost anything. But God is looking for those that really do, that give a life of consecration in that secret place and say, God, I'll do it. Regarding the call, Evan said this, everyone must obey and go where God directs him. That is the great lesson we have to learn. If God calls, we must obey. Do not ask, what will become of me? It does not matter. God is a God of light. He has plenty of light to shed upon your path. When we are doing it out of love, we stop focusing on us, on the cost, on what might happen. And we focus on, God, I love you, and I love people. I believe in this hour, the church has got to get a hold of the true love message. Because the world is to know us by our love. And that love is so realized and demonstrated behind the scenes where we're broken on the altar, laying down our life for the brethren. And then the outflow, what we do publicly, is the proof of that. It's the afterglow of our relationship with the living God. Evan Roberts' messages were very simple, but they continue to reflect that love. Let me share one. He said he appealed for their belief, which would prompt them to give their whole heart to Christ, the belief that would drive out devils and bring in angels. He didn't preach long, complicated messages, but he preached that love that had captured him, swallowed him. Let me finish with this one, another one from a newspaper that quoted him as saying, I love Jesus. Boys of the Rhonda, won't you too confess him? Oh, confess him. Do something for him. And I would say the same. Would you come and in the name of Jesus, would you be wrecked by his love? Would you behind the scenes in that secret place when no one is looking, you're not doing it for the attention of men, for people to see, for glory from people. But God, I love you. I just want to know you and allow him to so impart to you his vision, his purpose. And out of love, because he so loved us, and let that love swallow you up, consume you, and then out of that love, see people through that love. Let that love so control us. Let that love, and that's how I would define this, the love of God controlled him. And when the love of God controls us, what God will do is incredible. It's always beyond us. We need revival. And I pray, God, will you do it again? And I know God is looking, can I find a people? Can I find a people seeking my face, humbling themselves, broken by my love? Well, I pray this episode has blessed you and I encourage you to check out more. And I just want to thank you for watching. And if it has blessed you, in the name of Jesus, would you please like, share, subscribe, and add your comments. Because as you do, you really help us. And let us stand together and cry out to God and ask for the rain that we might see another revival. Amen. Thank you.